Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about quantum theory and how we can look at the atom in a quantum manner, quantized, meaning very discrete levels. And we will talk about the various energy levels that are applied and how we can describe the orbits of electrons by the use of various quantum numbers. So let's go ahead and start get started on this. And what we want to look at first is that we talked about how light had a wave and a particle nature. Well, it turns out that particles have a wave nature as well. So when we look at a particle in the macroscopic world, it has a specific momentum. And we discussed this back in the physics section that momentum is given by the mass times the velocity. However, the microscopic world is different. The rules are different and we remember that light behaves like a particle and the question is can an electron behave like a wave and we can determine its wavelength here the that the electron does behave like a wave and that wavelength is given by H Planck's constant divided by the mass times the velocity. So h divided by m times v, which is h over p, the momentum that we looked at previously. So there is a wavelength associated with, the, with this. And the wavelengths are described by quantum numbers that there are specific wavelengths. So you can have n times the wavelength, where n is 1, 2, or 3, but not fractional values. So you only have very specific values for the wavelength that an electron can have in its orbit around an atom. Now we can look at uh, light has a dual nature. Well, so do electrons. Electrons also have a dual nature, as would any other particle. And we saw previously how we could calculate the wavelength associated with the particle. And we can see the nature of electrons as waves when we send them through slits. So if we do the double slit experiment, as we've looked at with light, when we send electrons through the same thing, we get interference and we will get areas of constructive interference and areas of destructive interference just as we would for light waves. So here we can see electrons behaving much as waves as well. So here when we look at them individually at with just a small amount it kind of looks like they're random but over time as you build that up you see that there are very definite areas of concentration and very definite areas of depletion where you do not see very many electrons. Now we can do some examples in a calculation with this. So if we want to calculate the wavelength of an electron, and if it's traveling at a velocity of 10 to the seventh meters per second, and the mass of the electron is 9.109 times 10 to the negative 28th grams, and we can then figure out its wavelength. Now, how would we do this? Well, let's go ahead and use our equation, which says it's equal to Planck constants constant divided by the mass times the velocity. Well, we know these values and we can see we know what the value for h is. The mass of the electron were given, but do remember there is a conversion involved because we want to switch to SI units were given in grams and we have to divide that by a thousand to get it into kilograms. Dividing by 1000 would mean three more negative decimal places here. So it would be 10 to the negative 31st. And we multiply that by the velocity, which is given in meters per second. So we can go ahead now and calculate that, just multiply and divide that out, and find that the wavelength associated with the electron is 7.274 times 10 to the negative 11th meters. So we can calculate this for any object moving. We're just going to find that the wavelengths are in are, can be incredibly small. So in this case, we do see some very small wavelengths as we notice here. Now, one thing we next thing we want to talk about is the uncertainty principle given by Heisenberg. And it discusses how accurately we can measure the properties of an electron or any other particle. And there is a limit to how accurately you can know the position and the momentum of an electron simultaneously. So the, the error in the uh, 
position determination and the error in the momentum determination are given by h bar over 2. Now, for macroscopic objects like you or me or any other large object, it's not very significant. So we can essentially measure them accurately because this number will be so small. But this does give a limit when we start measuring things at the quantum level when we are looking at very, very small low mass objects, we might be able to know the position very well. But in order to keep this true, we might not know the momentum very well. Or alternatively, we may know the momentum, but that may give us a very uncertain position. So it is the ultimate limit on what can actually be known in science. So it's not that better measurements or things could need to be done better or bet different experiments. There simply is an intrinsic limit in nature as to how accurately certain things can be known. Now we want to look at the quantum numbers here for most of the rest of this lecture. And we have four quantum numbers that are going to be associated with the electrons. The first is the principal quantum number, which tells you the shell, what shell is it in? And the energy levels are given by quantum numbers of one, two, three, and so on. So n equals one is the lowest state closest to the nucleus two is the next state and three is the one above that and the energy increases as you move up in the energy levels. Now you can also use the there's a second quantum number which is the angular momentum. And this gives levels that start at zero and then go up to one two and end up one less than the principal quantum number. So that's what n minus one means here. So if n is three for example, then you can have L equals 0, 1, and 2. It'll be go from 0 up to 1 less than the principal quantum number. So for L equals 0, those are what we call the s orbitals. L equals 1 are the p orbitals. L equals 2 are d orbitals. And then we use f, g, and h. 4, L, 3, 4, and 5 as we work our way through them. So the energy levels here, and we can see those in our image here. As we look at these levels, the S level is up here. These are this is this is S. The P levels are here. The D levels are here and you can see they get more and more complex. The S level is a very simple one, essentially a spherical area, uh, whereas the P levels are split uh, along the different axes here and into two pieces and the D levels into four and they get more and more complex as we work through uh, more of these uh, quant more of this air more of these quantum numbers. So when we look at these, the next one we have is the magnetic quantum number. So the magnetic quantum number is the spatial orientation of the orbital. So the number of those orbitals is twice the angular momentum quantum number plus one. So when L equals zero, two times zero is zero plus one. And for the S, for the S shell, there is only one uh, one condition that will occur. However, for P, P is quantum angular quantum number one, which means there are three different potential orientations. So you can have them here split along the X axis, along the Y axis or along the Z axis. So it tells something about the first first quantum number tells you what level you're in. The second tells you something about the shape. And here we're learning something about the orientation of the orbital within space. So principal quantum number gives us the electron energy. Secondary tells us the shape. And the third, the magnetic quantum number gives us the orientation of that orbital in space. So that's what we're seeing in our image here. Now when we look at the energies, we have one more quantum number because we have the orbital is labeled by the quantum number in the secondary. So we will say energies like 1s. So that is the principal quantum number. And then we use s, p, d, and f, and so on for 
the angular momentum quantum numbers. You could have 1s, you could have a 2s, you could have a 2p, but remember 2p is split by the magnetic quantum number into three sections. So there are three different sections here within the 2p orbital. For the d orbital, when we get up to that, there are five then that are available. So you can have more electrons because there are different orientations for these more complex structures. A very simple structure like the S ones can only have a small number of electrons, in fact, two. And you can have two electrons in each of these. But because there are three here, you can actually have two, two and two, leaving you with six electrons in a p orbital, 10 electrons in a d orbital, and so on. And that's because you can have electrons that are, have spin either up or down. So they can have spin in two different directions. And you can therefore have electrons with either that up or down spin. And they can have a spin of plus a half if it's up, minus a half if it's down. And those are then different electrons. So you can have one spin up electron and one spin down electron in each of those states that we looked at. So that allows each of those bars we looked at in the previous slide to allow us to have two two electrons in it. So an s orbital will have two electrons, a p will have six, and a d will have 10. Now we can summarize this a little bit here. And let's look at some of the details here. We know that there are four quantum numbers. And what we say is that there we have the exclusion principle uh, given by Pauli that says that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. So they ha cannot have that exact same set of quantum numbers. So you have the principal quantum number. Again, that tells you the, what shell you're in and the energy level. You have the angular momentum quantum number, which tells you the shape of the orbit. We have the magnetic quantum number, which tells us the orientation. And we have the spin quantum number, which t tells us the intrinsic direction spin of that electron. So and, and no electrons in an atom could have exactly the same quantum numbers. You could not have all four of these being exactly the same for any pair of electrons. Now let's look at an example here or a couple of examples. And we want to look at first of all, how many electrons can occupy a shell with n equals two and n equals five. So if n equals two, how can we figure out how many electrons it has? Well, n equals two has four orbitals. It has one 2s elect orbital and three 2p orbitals. So n equals two, you can have s or p. Remember, if n is two, you can have either l equals zero or one. So zero gives you the 2s orbital. One gives you the 2p orbital. But remember, that is split into three by the magnetic quantum numbers. You can have two electrons per orbital, and that means you can have a total of eight electrons in the n equals two level. Now, if we did the same thing for five, five has more orbitals. It has 25 of them. So we have a 5s, we have 5p, we have 5d, 5f, and 5g. And we know how many there are of each of them. Remember, we know what the orbital, the angular momentum quantum numbers are. They are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 here. And the number of magnetic and the number of the magnetic is 2 times L here. So 2L plus 1. So 2L plus 1 will then give us give us this. So for the n equals for l equals four, two times four is eight plus one gives us nine orbitals. And you can do that for the other ones as well. So if we add those up, nine plus seven is 16 plus five makes 21 plus three makes 24 and one more makes 25 with two electrons per orbital. That means 50 electrons are available in the n equals five shell. And it will continue to increase as we work towards higher levels. Now the last example we want to look at here is completing a table showing some of these.
So let's take a look at these. We know what the different quantum numbers are. And we're going to look at the first is a 4f shell. Well, 4f, remember that the 4 is the principal quantum number. So that is what you put in for n. And if you remember s, p, d, and f, that corresponds to 0, 1, 2, and 3 for the angular momentum quantum numbers. So if this is an f, that corresponds to 3. So L for this one is 3. And then the magnetic quantum number is 2 times L, which would be 6, plus 1, or 7. Now this one, we don't know the orbital, but we can figure it out because we know what n is here. So if n is 4, that is going to be a 4 something level, but we don't know which one yet. But we can figure it out because we know the L, the magnetic, the, sorry, the angular momentum quantum number. And 1 refers to p. So this is going to be a 4p level with a, a degeneracy here. The magnetic quantum number is going to be 2 times 1, which is 2 plus 1 or 3. Now this next one, we don't know this, we don't know the orbital again, but we do know what n is. So n equals 7, we can definitely put that portion in, but we don't know l either. But we do know that 2l plus 1 is 7, so 2l is 6, and l is therefore 3. So we can figure that out, and now that we know it's a 3, we know that this is a 7f orbital. And then finally, we want to look at the 5d. Well, we know we know the orbital now, so we know that n is 5. Remember that d corresponds to 2. And then the degeneracy, the magnetic uh, quantum number, would be 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 1, which gives us 5. So given some of that information, we can fill in the table and figure out all of the different quantum numbers that are present. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we've looked at this time is that electrons and par other particles behave like waves in the same way light can behave like a particle. So not only does light have a dual nature, but matter has a dual nature as well. We looked at the uncertainty principle, which limits how accurately we can know the position and the momentum of a particle simultaneously. And we then looked at the four quantum numbers that allow us to specify the state of an electron within an atom. So that concludes this lecture on quantum theory. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.